very good to be here. Whoa. No one wanted to middle seat, so I ended up having it. But that's how it is. So why don't you start, Theaster? Um, and maybe I thought um, the title for this talk is kind of interesting. The role of talking, the role of speech, the yeah. role of the sermon. So maybe, maybe it would be interesting to, to start with that. Yes. Well, first, it's really, it's really great to be here and to see you all. Um, it's amazing to uh, be in a room with Solowit and Frank Stella and um, the city of Basel, all in one room. Um, when I was young, uh, we had a, a very religious family. And always, uh, as a young person, I was reading different kinds of religious texts. But m my mom, you know, she talked a lot about just how important it was that, like, things start to happen when you say them. And good things can happen when you say them, or bad things could happen. And so this idea that, like, uh, say, in the Bible, there's this idea that creation started with God speaking. And it's like, okay, he said, let there be light, and then there was some light. And he said, let there be some fish, and there was fish. And, and this idea that one could kind of speak, speak life into the world way in advance of the thing being realized, one has to first say something. And so I think that for me, the, the sermon or speech acts or, or sharing your ideas with friends and stuff like this, this feels like a really important part of, the, of my work because most of the time I want to do things that are really kind of impossible. And the only way that I become more and more comfortable with this is I just say that I'm going to do it over and over. Like I'm going to have a show here. OK. Yeah. Really, I'm going to have a show. That would not have been enough in this case, but It's anyway. going to be a big show here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll run through these slides, and you guys can stop me. But I'll just try to weave a little story. Yeah. And then if we need to go back, we can. So pardon me, I'll try to go through them fast. I thought I would start with some uh, buildings. Uh, these are buildings. The building on, on your right is a building oh, on your left. Um, is the first building that I lived in in this neighborhood, Grand Crossing. Um, it was not, it didn't look that way when we started. It was the ugliest building on the block. And, um, and was it abandoned? It, it was. A family had lived there, but it was not in very good shape. Yeah. And so it was the only building I could afford, and I, I really liked it because it, it used to be a candy store in the front, and the, the family lived in the back, and I thought the candy store could be my studio, and then I could live in the back. But it feels important because, in a way, it's an architectural image, and, that, and now when people drive down my street, they slow down because the houses look different than the other houses. And I'll say this again with the Arts Bank, but I like this idea that what I'm involved in is not, it's not really like renovation or restoration alone. This is kind of like painting. It's like, can I create an image in the world that makes people want to stop and maybe reimagine their house or reimagine what a neighborhood might look like or this? And so I know that the, the, the work that was done, we call it architecture, we call it masonry, we put new windows in, there's framing. But I also think that there's another kind of work that is about um, painting and drawing and using the city as a kind of uh, a, 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 a basic backdrop, reforming architectural spaces so that good things could happen. But can you say, uh, because you, you moved into it, you inhabited it for a while, but yes. not, not for long. No, it became a different, it did not become yeah. just a private space. Right, so I lived in the building for five years, and then I went away to school again, and um, when I came back, the, the wood was rotten. So I had to gut it, and when I gutted it, I thought, okay, so I moved next door, and I moved across the street. I just stayed on the block, and um, when I gutted it, we... We, uh, we, I really liked it open, and I thought, oh, we should just keep it open. So in a way, the building started to iterate. So it was living space, and now we call it the listening house, and we have some archives there. 
and we use it for dinners and parties. All the spaces we use for dinners and parties. Every space. Is okay, uh, let's um, uh, perhaps underscore that because I think it's a, it's a very important statement, no? Yeah. We are in a museum here, yes. a public institution. You, uh, in the US, you uh, owning a house, owning a place is very important, mm -hmm. very basic. Most, mm -hmm. many people aspire to it's do that. It's the aspiration, It's yeah. kind of the way to almost exist, no? Yes. That's the, the basic idea of becoming a citizen of the United States, to have property. And, um, yeah. but instead of making it private and making it nice, you give it back to the public, mm. something that was private before. And I think that's, that's an important uh, uh, kind of a criteria for be behind your whole philosophy of, of doing your work. Oh. I think so. The, what I like about the building, too, is that, like I said, it was such an ugly building. Uh, like, really, my, and it was, in a, it was a bad neighborhood, so my friends, some of them who lived in different neighborhoods didn't want to come visit. My family was a little bit worried. But over time, as we restored the building, we were able to do things with this little building just by highlighting the values within the basic shell. And then it, it became a very beautiful building. And so demonstrating that, that a, a certain kind of quality of life could exist where I lived was very important. And so we paid very close attention in that way to the architecture, not only because of architecture, but to demonstrate that we could control space and make it really, really beautiful. Sir? But Fiesta, you said, you said we, and probably many oh. people here in the audience don't know exactly what that means, we. Maybe you can elaborate on this because it's an important aspect of your work, I think, this we, the people yeah. you do this with. Now, this is a problem. Like, when a guy starts saying we all the time, this is a problem. <laughs> that, that's why I try to this is a problem. <laughs> intervene. Well, sometimes when I say we, I mean me and my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> or me and my accountant. And then there are other times I say we, and I mean my uh, studio team. At one point, we were the studio, we. We were a big studio. After um, Documenta, we were like 24 people. And then Documenta was so much fun, we just kept working together. But this became very expensive to have a staff of 24 people. And so we weren't making art, we were just rehabbing the buildings. And so there's that we, the studio. Um, I work for the University of Chicago and also uh, I started a charitable organization called Rebuild. And between my studio, the university and Rebuild, there is a we of about 60 people. And so I, but really when I say we, I just mean it took more than me by myself to do a thing. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that uh, it could be any number of we's, but I think your question is right because they also point to the need for different organizational structures, different financial structures, different vision structures, and then some structures can move faster than others. And so where you need a certain amount of infrastructure, that thing then maybe moves slower. And then when I can pay some guys on the street to help me tear down a wall like this, then sometimes things can move very fast. And so I like moving between these modes, maybe of six or seven different modes of uh, organizing in order to do the different kinds of work. Mm -hmm. So this is um, um, a remarkable building here, uh, the rest of it. So um, um, we should maybe talk about it. So you've, you've talked or you mentioned the listening room. There's also a building called the Archive. The Archive House. The Archive House. Black Cinema House. Black Cinema House. Mm -hmm. And so all these are all, as you, as you can see, these are all public spaces or the, the purpose of them is to be public and to do public mm -hmm programs and to give something back to the, to the neighborhood there. What about this, this um, amazing thing here? Well, I thought I would talk about my building projects in relationship to the rest of my neighborhood 
where there's ambitious architecture that had been built, beautiful buildings, but there's no vision for them and there's no resources to keep them active. So even though this church was built at the turn of the century by an amazing team of Italian masons and painters and guildsmen, um, uh, the archdiocese just didn't have the resources to keep the building up. The local parishioners moved as the neighborhood changed races and changed immigrant communities. So from Italian to Polish to Jewish to black, this kind of thing. And so um, my work is happening in the backdrop of projects like this. And, and so I didn't have the resource necessary to have vision and, and the rest, rest, restoration power and so we were able to ask um, the demo crew, hey, do you mind if for a couple days we come in and we do one last sermon uh, in the space and maybe we, we, we move some things around and make some performances? And they said, okay, well, if you pay us a little bit, you know, we got to slow down our demo guys, so you got to pay us. And so we paid them. And they didn't think that we would pay them, but we paid them. And then they said, well, you know, we got some brick. You want some brick? You know? I was like, yeah, I like brick. <laughs> and, um, you know, we have some marble. And so, um, and so what we did was we, we really just wanted to, like, have some action and some speeches. And in, in, in the, I don't know what it's called, one of the upper, yes, like the, a... The Cupola, yeah, yeah. say up, up here, the there, was a, there was a beautiful painting of the Last Supper. Wow. And I thought, Phew, this is good. So I would say to Jesus while he's eating, before you go, can you just do one last act? Can you, can you come here and, and, and talk to the bulldozer man? Can you come and speak to the brick stacking man, can you come and clean up this room that we might sup with you, that we might dine with you, and that in this last moment, if you would perform, if you could rebuild your temple, then I'd know you're real, you know, and the bulldozer guys are doing their thing. Um, but it ended up that there was, there was no, um, there was no, there was a, this, the church was called St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence was the, the maker of churches and libraries. He was burned for his deep, devout relationship to God. And so after I had bought the brick and the stone and the marble and the wood and everything they could sell, um, they said, well, we have this statue and this bell. And so, and so we ended up with St. Lawrence. With, with St. Lawrence. Um, are we going to show the video later? Or? Yes. Okay. okay. It's at the end. I think. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Uh, well, St. Lawrence, um, f fascinating. You talked about uh, dinner and Last Supper mm. because uh, when I believe the, the myth, the legend of St. Uh, Lawrence when he was uh, martyred, uh, tortured really in the most brutal way. He was grilled uh, like a sausage on the fire. And he, and I think when the, the legend says that he, he cried and, and said, I'm grilled on one side, turn me around, yes. grill me on the other side. Yes. Um, so um, he's the man. <laughs> uh, which leads us maybe to talk about, you know, food. And because that was, I think, my second... Um, <laughs> Second, uh, actually, a uh, way to encounter you, food. Yeah. No, yeah. You organized this thing, uh, it was about jazz and it was about food. It mm. was ritual, a ritual at uh, Project Row Houses. Mm. So, um, because, you know, we, we've been talking about reading and neighborhood and cities and urban situations and art and non-art, but the, the really basic things that humans do, uh, one of them is eating and mm. food. Mm. And food is also a way to connect with people. Yeah. I mean, I think that if we, if we, keep, if we keep the St. Lawrence part connected to food, I also think that there's a way in which, in this political moment, a certain kind of radical uh, 
uh, discipleship might be quite useful. That a, a kind of uh, a, an overwhelming generosity to the point of uh, personal loss. And, and that, that in some ways, if you're going to f kind of be deeply engaged in this political moment, one has to be willing to have the heart of a kind of uh, radical. And, and so I like, I, I do think that um, a part of my practice is interested in this idea of a kind of deep uh, identifying where resources come from to make things happen. Mm -hmm. And food fits into that, and the construction of these buildings fit into that. And then, like, once the buildings are done, creating a much more intimate occasion where um, three people, 10 people, 15 people who would not normally know each other, where there might be the occasion that they would get to know each other and expedite a new set of relationships so that new kinds of things can happen. Now, the, the dinner table has been one of the most effective ways of doing that. But also, I think, by making these spaces that don't cost money to get into, they, so immediately, if you don't have to pay a $25 ticket, because that would automatically mean some people can come and some can't. Mm -hmm. And so, so trying to figure out ways that um, you, you can make a free zone and in order to make a free zone, it means that the resources have to live somewhere else. And so this, this then starts to create a really complicated dynamic of big ideas, big buildings, um, small ideas, local people, small dinners. And I think that it's, it's in this, it's the willingness to have this messy mix of things that are not always, oh, I only have small dinners or I only build big buildings, but it's this uh, in-between that makes for some interesting things for me. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can say something more about how you reached this idea to use art as something to reflect urban planning processes. Sure. So, so if, we were to, if we go to this building, this project, where um, the statue is the statue from St. Lawrence. It's a statue of St. Lawrence. So St. Lawrence lost his home. So then I'm trying to figure out what to do with St. Lawrence. <laughs> so I take him to the Venice Biennial of uh, 2015 because the martyr needs a home. Mm -hmm. And then I take him to Bregan's and I basically keep St. Lawrence on the road, <laughs> uh, allowing him to bless all the new spaces but also in a way carrying the fact that his home is gone. And so in a way, like these, um, these, these works here, these are like my roofing works. So St. Lawrence was here and then the roof was just above him and he's here. And so he lost his roof. And so there I am again, talking about the need for a shelter. So I'm, I'm taking a kind of a conceptual swing toward this idea that something's really broken at home. And in a way, the brokenness at home is fueling the, um, the, the output of the, of the new work. So in a way, if St. Lawrence hadn't been torn down, I would not have conceived of a show with the, the sculpture of St. Lawrence. Like, I, I need certain things to happen in the real world that then kind of give me a reason to wrestle with these, these problems. But if I were to try to talk about it another way, I, I think there's a way in which, say, if you have, um, if an artist is involved uh, in studio work, and that could take up 100% of my time, uh, I've not been able to be that kind of artist. That, that in a way, the studio work the, the work of my life is bigger than the studio. And so there are times when the work needs to be in the studio and I'm making art, but also I feel like I'm being as creative when these other things are happening, like a building down the street is being torn down. It needs my response. Um, some, some kids who live local break my window because they think we're just young white hipsters. And then, and then I need to have a conversation with them and then maybe try to employ them or maybe 
meet their, their parents or be in their lives and we take a ride in the Range Rover, you know, this kind of thing. That, that it's like, you know, and those things that are happening inside and outside the studio, they then together make the practice. And I think they make the practice way more interesting. Mm -hmm. So th was there a moment when you, f um, because you, I think one of the interesting things to me at least in your kind of uh, career, if one can use that word, is that you came from outside art mm. and sort of conquered it in a way, uh, mm. art. Um, and is there, was there a moment when you knew uh, or when you felt strongly that art would be really useful to kind of reach your goals, to, you know, the things you really wanted to do. Obviously, you wanted to save a neighborhood. You wanted to be, to create space for people. You wanted to uh, stop this process of, of, of neglect and demolition and crime and, and uh, all that stuff that happens in the big cities, mm. especially in the US. When was, you know, it would be interesting to, to see when did what was art kind of a, a when did it become really um, important in that, in that yeah. project process? This is a really, comp this is a tough question, Joseph, because in a way, uh, you know, like, I'm here, that's Sol Lewitt, that's Frank Stella, and I'm going to have a show here. And this, I'm really going to have a show here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is still kind of a hard thing to swallow, in a way, that, that um, the way I imagine I had my first real museum opportunity in like 2007, 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. Then in 2010 was my second museum opportunity and it's 2017, and so this is a relatively short life and the life of artists. So I feel very fortunate in this way. But when you, when you say words like conquer, let's say conquer. Yeah, yeah, it's not a good word. No, no, let's say conquer. Okay. Um, that I think there was a moment when I recognized that the platform or the vehicle of art, the apparatus of the art world production, that, that this apparatus had the same kinetic power that maybe the Catholic Church had in the 1500s mm -hmm. or in the 1800s or this, that it was a kind of a, a, a vehicle, a mobile vehicle for the transmission of heavy thoughts. And that, and that it, had, it had real estate, it had money, it had propaganda, it had a, a doctrine that you could either transgress or believe in, and this is great. That, that since people no longer go to the sanctuary, the religious sanctuary, it seemed in some way that art had become a surrogate for this. That was very interesting to me even before there was any, any, anything in my practice that was adjacent to it, let alone winning or conquering. But then this idea that um, if I'm going to enter, if I'm going to enter the Catholic Church, I want to be Pope. I don't want to, I don't want to enter like as the, as the bell boy, <laughs> you know, the candle dude. <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to be like the chief nun. Okay. You know. That's even harder. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, so, uh, and, uh, and so I think that, there, that very quickly I thought if I'm going to then give my beliefs mm -hmm. to art, then I don't want to waste my time doing it. I don't want to waste, I don't want to waste my time. Yeah, yeah. And, so the, and so it felt more urgent than like, oh, I'm just playing around. It was like, no, I, I, ha I have to do this. Um, so I, I don't even know. So there's a part of me that feels like art is for real. Mm -hmm. It's sincere. It's, it's non-apologetic. It, I carry my political feelings to my works of art. It's not neutral. It, it, is, it, it has... Yeah. Well, and maybe you should, uh, because not everyone may know that you studied ceramics. I mean, yeah. uh, many, probably, many people may know, but I think that's a very, very um, 
concrete and a very tangible and a very strong way of, you know, not just, I mean, this is real art. I mean, this yeah. is real objects. And yes. So maybe you should uh, briefly talk about that. You still have uh, a ceramic shop? Yes, yeah, so I'll talk about ceramics, Joseph, in relationship to, like, um, craft and discipline. Yeah, yeah. So that I was, I was learning clay in college, and my dad taught me roofing as a boy. And in a way, both were kind of bastard, they were bastard uh, ideologies. To be a laborer, there was nothing sexy about what my dad did to himself. He didn't think being a roofer was sexy. And for the potter, uh, the craftsman who's always feeling like craft is kind of outside of some other world, maybe a little less so now, that I feel like maybe these two tensions made me feel like I was part of a sexy minority class, <laughs> race aside. Okay. Yep. And, and in, I think that in this way, you know, I'm showing these two works, that roofing in a way and ceramics became ways of having a vocabulary that was complementary to the vocabulary of art, <laughs> that it was complementary to the vocabulary of art, but also um, it could compete with the traditional mm -hmm. materials, the, ma the traditional methods, you know, that I, that I could in, in fact deploy something akin to a minimalism using a completely different set of materials like clay or roofing materials and, and, and have that competition be an equal one. Yeah, I, I wanted to get back to this idea of like what, what you show is like roo roofing as painting in a way. And yeah. I wanted to get back to this thing that you mentioned before of uh, the building as sculpture. Yes. And I, I wondered or I'm, I'm sure that you were also inspired by Dan Peterman's building project that he started in Chicago on 61st Street in the early 90s, mid 90s. Yep. And also an, another reference point that I could see is, is Donald Judd's building on Spring Street. Mm. And these, these, both, these two building projects, somehow there's a tension, you know, between building a sculpture as something autonomous and building a sculpture as something social. Can you relate to these two examples and, and, and maybe locate your practice or relate your practice to, the, to these two examples and differentiate them? Yeah. So you guys, Dan Peterman is a, is a Chicago-based artist who um, is one of our great conceptualists. He, he uses a lot of recycled materials in his works, plastics, woods, um, old businesses, he, and, and, and very much in the spirit of, uh, like I think he has a lot of Joseph Boy's books as well. <laughs> he had a space called the Experimental Station in Chicago, and when I was about 25, um, I went to Dan and said, you know, I'm a young artist and I need some space and I'd like to, you know, be around you. And, and he became like a mentor. And we, okay. you know, we, we were very cool and for, for a long time. And about three years later, 2008, 2007, 8, he said, um, you know, I, I think that you are ready to go. And I was like, are you kicking me out? <laughs> and he said, no, I think that you have something to develop, and maybe you could have a long-term project of your own, mm -hmm. but you should always have a long-term project, no matter what, is, what else is happening outside in the world, you should always have something that you come home to. And, and really, it was Dan alone, Dan Peterman, who kind of encouraged me to think about Dorchester as, a, as, a, as an intervention that I could grow. Mm -hmm. It was still, we didn't know what it would become, but it, it was important. And then I think with Judd, you know, and, and we could also relate this to Smithson and uh, f maybe Flavin, but, but definitely like for the folk who were interested in what else could happen outside of the museum and, and why would we need something to happen outside of the museum. And for Judd, it was things like, what if I want to look at something longer than the exhibition schedule? Um, what if the thing that we loved in 1990, the context changed, and in 2000, we love it for totally different reasons. Mm -hmm. But what if it was up for all 10 years, slowly 
changing as if light was changing it, but in fact, the politics are changing it. Um, and so these ideas were ideas that I knew of. The land art movement was something that I was familiar with, but I thought, why would I go spend $25 million in a place that no one lives in? Why would I ask Dominique de Menil to support an abandoned town? Why wouldn't I leverage those resources and do them in the place where I live and have those resources actually creating change? So, so, so what feels complicated then is that if we were to think about land art, what happens when you land a work of art in an in a already existing neighborhood with uh, people who have different values and people who don't know what the, what the hell you're doing? Uh, uh, and so I think that uh, to, to make art, to make Spiral Jetty, Getty, Spiral Jetty in a place where there is nothing, then, then it's only the park services who, who are nervous. But, but to make a work of art in a place where there's thousands of people who live among you and they're trying to figure out who are all these visitors, why are they here, why is our neighborhood changing, this is a more complicated grappling. So I think that for me, Judd represents a kind of ambition to, to have art live beyond the institutional mechanisms that might predetermine how they live. So it's the building as shelter, whereas your building is the building as intervention. Yes. Maybe. Buildings as possibility. Mm -hmm. Buildings as a, a and, and, and land and land ownership. You know, like what's interesting about, say, these squatters that I met in Paris, they know that in three years the building won't be there anymore. So they've been investing in this building, putting lots of energy in for the last 10 years, and three years from now, this Salvation Army will be gone. Mm -hmm. It'll be condominiums. And so for everyone, its use in the meantime is great, but what if all of those squatters were owners in the cooperative of the future of this building? And I think this is where things, at least mm -hmm. from my world, where they become much more interesting, the ability to, by virtue of land, stay and fight, right, by the, by the mechanisms that the law allow fighting to happen today. So I, I, I think that I am in a conversation because Judd was moving between a grand real estate project, mm -hmm. architectural project, and then the, that architectural project was then informing um, works of art that were being made to go into museums. In fact, they were... They were was very inter, uh, sort of uh, interrelated or interactive even. He was, of course, a furniture maker and an artist, and it's, we haven't mentioned him yet, but he's also in that space here with that, right. that piece over there. Um, yes, but uh, let's maybe move forward. Sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, I'm very happy that this uh, piece here is part of the, the Kunstmuseum Basel's collection. We, we bought it this uh, past, uh, some uh, fall, and maybe you can say just a few words sure. about it. This was part of your show in Brigands, and, um, and it's a very interesting and uh, complex work. Sure, so um, I, I work with archives sometimes, and this is, uh, uh, on, on your left, it's a picture of Shirley Temple, who was the, the, the daughter of our nation for a while. And I think um, we love her and we love her talent, but so much of her talent was actually uh, the byproduct of working with really uh, amazing black uh, uh, dancers and singers and, and her ability to kind of capture and appropriate the sound and the dancing this. And in the, on the right side is Bojangles, a really accomplished uh, dancer who would, who would dance uh, for the children in these movies. And so you have uh, Shirley Temple who's already powerful at six years old. Uh, powerful enough to be able to say to the teacher, her teacher, Bojangles, come dance for me and my six-year-old friends. Um, but uh, in this movie, she is attempting to hide herself from the uh, Union, uh, from, the, from the Union uh, Army. Yeah. And to do that, she decides to um, uh, hide in a closet with the slaves on the estate and put shoe polish on her face 
as a way of disappearing. So this idea of black temple is that I'm, I'm both trying to address the idea of the architecture of that, the closet, the architecture of hiding, the presence of war, and then use Shirley Temple as a kind of um, a measure of both the complex relationships of race in the United States and also how um, there is a kind of symbiotic need um, that in a way Shirley Temple made Bojangles famous and Bojangles made her uh, skillful. Yeah, yeah. He was the talent and she was kind of the one who uh, yeah. could take advantage because of yeah. the political yeah. Um, yeah, situation. Um, this, again, we are still in the exhibition at the Kunsthaus in Bregenz. We did also, by the way, purchase this first uh, object here. Um, maybe, sir, and uh, why don't you say something about it? It's called uh, Tar Baby. Mm. As you can see, it's a pallet on wood, a wooden pallet. And this is a, um, um, a tar uh, what was it called? Yeah, it's uh, like a a bitumen. It's like a, the roofing yeah. membrane that keeps the water out. Yeah, that's functioning as a blanket for her resting head. What about yeah, and, and her resting head? What, mm. What's where, where? What's because this is not a small head. It's not the head of a puppet, or is yeah. it the head of a puppet? It's a. It's. It is. It is the head of a kind of black fetish yeah. in a way that was just a comical fetish, probably built and made in the 30s or 40s that I had replicated. And I've never said this out loud, but I think uh, this is my uh, response to Brancusi, in a way. That it's a, it's a, it's a kind of nod <clears throat> at Brancusi's elegance at depicting uh, the sleeping negress, mm. or yeah. Uh, yeah. These, these moves. And, and kind of a response in, in that way then to modernism in a way that, that, um, that I wanted to come to these uh, epics of artistic practice, these epic moments that have been named whatever they've been named with my own materials, with my own ways of working. And I think that Tar Baby in that way is kind of asking questions about what does it mean for Brancusi to appropriate the black image to make uh, or, or to be inspired by or appropriate? And then what does it mean for me to look at Brancusi and try to bring it back to something that's familiar to me? But maybe you should also add that a lot of the objects that you are using in this kind of series come from a collection mm. that's in a way a, a documentation or a documentary collection of everyday racism in the US, right? Yes. Of a, maybe you can talk yes. about this this guy who made this I'm I'm also so fascinated by this collection because the guy who did it he was not, not just choosing these things to collect them to document everyday racism but also to take the things out of everyday life by collecting them that's which right. I which I think is a fantastic uh, yes. move but you can tell more about this sure. collection because it's one of the many or some collections that you started collecting right which yes. is also a practice well, you so have. in the buildings, I needed some stuff. You know, I needed something to keep people in the building longer. And so I, <laughs> I started, you know, I, I love books, and I started collecting them. And, but a, there was a gentleman, his name is Ed Williams, and he had a collection of, we call it Negrobilia, a kind of collection of black objects, some of them derogatory, some, some uh, pap works on paper, but essentially, wherever he would travel around the world, he would buy these things so that other people couldn't. Yeah. As, as a kind of removal yeah. from the market. And then when he got them home, um, he would then tr try to organize them until his wife and his children didn't want them around anymore. <laughs> and so he needed to figure out a home for them. But in this way, in the same, at the same time that he's trying to take them away, he was taking them away because when you have the object without a conversation or a dialogue, it's just the object, then the object is speaking, and this could be very complicated. And so in a way, I've had to create opportunities where uh, we can build a dialogue around these objects. So there's 6,000 of them, and then we also have a collection of books, and some of these things may 
be a part of uh, what enters the Kunstmuseum mm -hmm. next year. So you partly enlarge them, appropriate them. Mm. But uh, maybe uh, just another question, because again, I think what's important to realize about your work is that you're going really large, you're going really big. And uh, if you would talk about Brancusi, you would talk about kind of an icon of modernism. You talk about you know, modernism as this huge, uh, this sort of authority of you know, modern, mod Brancusi is one of the authorities of modern art, really. And, um, but what you are doing is you're taking material from a different sector, from, uh, as you said, negrobilia or uh, uh, everyday objects, even sometimes just you know, fragments of objects that have, have been destroyed, and you're reintroducing them into a kind of dialogue with modernism. And, um, and I think that's, a, that's a, a really interesting strategy. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we put, if, let's say there are, there are two parallel worlds for my life. There is one world that feels like it's outside of me that I've had to learn all my life that includes things like modernism, but maybe also the histories of a certain kind of Western world yeah. or the way language works. All these things that are fundamental. And this is one track. And then there's my real life. There's the way I talk at home. There's my friends and the way we hang out. There's the set of skills that I learned from my family, different from the skills that I would learn in other kinds of institutions. Vernacular, let's say, yeah. perhaps. And this vernacular thing always has to hide under this other thing so that one is only always committed to this dominant Dom modernism wants, it is from a world of dominance. Yeah. Yeah. And so always I'm having to do this so that I can never talk about tarring, I can only talk about uh, bronze. But in fact, I don't want to talk about bronze. I don't find bronze necessarily interesting for bronze alone. And if I could then imagine that the, the things that I bring from my vernacular world as are important or more interesting, more compelling, as the things that I'm supposed to talk about, then how do I make these things win? Mm -hmm. And so, so when I talk about winning, I'm talking about uh, the choice to be oneself against a, a world that is constantly wanting you to be something else, mm -hmm. a, a kind of predetermined power that says, if you make things like that, this could be great. Mm. But we don't know, we don't know the value of this. We don't know if this would be, and I think that that kind of uh, awkward question is something that maybe Kunstmuseum is taking a chance on, and that maybe the history of um, abstract expressionism in Basel has been a willingness to take certain risks with artists who are pushing against this thing well in advance of us knowing who Barnett Newman is, who, who, who Agnes Martin is, who, who any of these folk are, that, that you guys were already performing that work. And so it feels like if we can commit to this, then it then, it then gives new context for mm -hmm. modernism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, I, that I, in fact, want to know Brancusi better because of the Tar Baby. Yeah, great. That's a very good way to uh, justify that that acquisition for the museum. Thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, but also, <laughs> Write that down. Uh, but also, it is, of course, exactly, I, I, like you, I, mean, I, I like the fact that you mentioned this moment when the Kunstmuseum Basel was really among the very, very first to, to uh, integrate uh, new art from across the ocean into its very European collection. But I believe now we have to do another step, which is to sort of break up that canon a little bit and introduce new material to make that canon a new uh, kind of a discovery. So why don't we uh, go to, th to this one here? Okay, I'll run through a couple of these, yeah. please. Uh, you don't, or do you want to show a video now? We yes. could jump out you know of how? the press. Yeah. I, think, I think yes. Uh.
we interrupt here, no? Yeah. So this, I mean, in a way, I, I think we could advance to some of the later slides, like toward the end, but this video feels really important to me because um, um, it, it starts to combine all the things that I care about. And you can see now the Lord's, the Last Supper mm. yep. uh, up above, yep. and already they've taken out that portion of the brick wall. And so it's just like the sanctuary directly exposed to the hood. And, um, you know, in this improvisational moment, you know, in a way we're asking like, um, you know, maybe there's so much violence because God left and like because the church wasn't praying anymore for the neighborhood. And so there was this kind of mashup of like architecture and urbanism and these art historical moments and performance. And, and I think that, that uh, this project really, it, it really is the, is the kind of art I want to make. Why don't you say a few words about your colleagues here, the musicians? They're a wonderful group of uh, musicians, and we plan to bring them to Basel. Uh, you have worked with them for a number of years. Yeah. And so we, I have a band. It's <laughs> <laughs> cool. We're the Black Monks of Mississippi, and um, we, we basically make a kind of, um, a kind of root music that's rooted maybe both between the black charismatic traditions of gospel and diasporic religious music, black religious music, and then um, ch chant and meditation vehicles. So um, we often work in a kind of modal sound, um, and I hope to really rock out here in Basel, we're gonna really, really, really rock out. Okay, let's let's wait and see. Let's hope. <laughs> um, I'm gonna skip past some things. Can I yes. do this, Joseph? Yes, absolutely. So, um, oh, yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, son. Um, so this is my dad's tar kettle, and it's the first body of works that I'm making claiming this heritage of painting that was never called painting, but in fact, my dad was doing some serious, like, swordsmanship on this roof. And um, if, if, for those of you who have ever roofed, done tar on a roof, you know, you have these moments where, like, you've tarred everything, and then you have to get off the roof. And how do you get off when you have this sticky stuff? And my dad had all these ways of doing this, or like um, maybe he would start by roofing the chimney and, and we, we, um, uh, the flashing, the thing that helps to keep water from the brick mm -hmm. onto the roof. So you have this flashing and then this membrane and then the roofing material, then you tar all these things. And the way that he would do that, you know, and it's like, I can just see him, he, he you know, and it required such a strong core, but with this mop, it was like one move, like dip and like whap. And, and, and it was like, if you, if you stayed too long in a place with like 20 pounds of tar on the mop head, then the mop would pool mm -hmm. and you would have too much tar in one place. It would create these inconsistencies. And so you really had to have a kind of um, zen-like understanding of this material. Mm -hmm. But he is just a roofer. Mm -hmm. No one's talking about it as like Chinese calligraphy or, or uh, action painting or a response to Pollock. It's like maybe my dad with his drip tars is actually the best respondent to Jackson Pollock. Right. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. We go on. We go on. That's, a, that's, that's another piece we bought. Woo! I'm very happy for this. <laughs> So we have three works, yeah. Um, and by the way, by the way, uh, Theaster has donated one piece. His galleries didn't want that to happen, but he did it anyway. So we, we have a, a whole group yeah. of works. So 
Let's talk about this. This is a very important initiative. There's also actually a, a, a relationship with Basel, with Art Basel. So this is the Stony Island State Savings Bank. It was about to be demolished in Chicago. I asked the mayor in the city if they would not demolish it and that I would find the resources to restore it. It's three blocks away from where I live, but it's the last of this kind of faux neoclassical um, uh, facade, big structure, a big public building. It's a former bank, uh, and, and it, it really deserved another life, and it was the right scale because in a way, because Dorchester is a private residential street, it was um, not appropriate sometimes for our neighbors that all this traffic was being created. We needed a public venue. And so um, uh, uh, the and mayor said yes. it's a beautiful building. He's, yes, it's a beautiful building. The mayor said yes. And we um, restored the building. And in part, once we purchased the building for a dollar, we were given the building, I didn't have any money to do the restoration. But in the bathrooms, all of the, um, the partitions, they were marble and the back wall was marble and people had pulled out all the marble to get to the pipes, the copper. They didn't want the marble, they wanted the pipes. And so we, we took these bro broken pieces of marble and made these bank bonds. We call them bank bonds, little marble bonds. And we brought them to Basel, Switzerland during the Basel Fair in 2012, maybe? Uh, 2012, 2013? I believe so, yeah. And um, we sold them, and it felt really nice to have a failed bank uh, redeemed by a bank bond uh, being sold to Swiss bankers <laughs> for the restoration of this thing that would then become a cultural center. Wonderful. I think that's, that's everything. That's really a summary of what you, what you want to do. So... Yep. So the, the building thing. became popular. Yeah. What, it, what is it? Yeah. So. And, and then we filled it with more archives. Like, in a way, we, we wanted the building to be like a repository for things that were culturally specific that people in the neighborhood would love. So the record collection we have is like house music, soul music, R&B, you know, some hip hop. And, and people use it all the time. And in a way, the bank is like a sanctuary. And maybe you can go to the next one. It's, al it's also like a response to this failed sanctuary, you know, and we can go on. Yep. And <clears throat> in some ways, again, it's like, what's, what is this relationship between the things that happen in the hood or on my block and then these other kinds of, um, these things that we understand as art? Maybe the bank we don't always understand as art. Usually yeah. not, yeah. You know. Although, yeah. yeah. Actually, the, the, the building next to the museum is interestingly also a bank, re, refurbished or repurposed uh, as a, a place where we now have our offices. You probably know that. So there is, even there, there is a, an interesting connection. So maybe you have one more slide with Du Bois. Yeah, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. uh, Mary, uh, maybe just a few words about this. This is really interesting. Uh, Right. So if, if we keep the idea of the archive and how do we make these lesser known ideas, how do we make them concrete again or make them interesting again? And, and I think about this also at Kunstmuseum where there are lots of things uh, that are, that are um, beautiful, but maybe there'll never be an exhibition about them. Lots of photographs and, and, and drawings and prints. And, and how, how do you take obscure everyday images by unknown artists and unknown people and make those things uh, interesting to a public. And in this case, Du Bois is an a African-American uh, sociologist and, and intellectual who was the first brother to go to Harvard and um, was really important in the creation of an early um, black rights group called the, the Niagara Movement. And, um, Du Bois was invited to Paris, to the Paris Exposition of 1900, to talk about the conditions of black people since slavery. So since 1856, it's now 1900, what is the progress of black people? And uh, in order to do that, Du Bois decided that he would hire a research team to figure out 
how many people owned land, how many blacks had become uh, business owners, did they have uh, potable water in their houses, did they have kitchen utensils that they were purchasing, all of the devices of sociology and um, in, in a way a kind of early cultural anthropology to show that there was progress being made. But what I didn't expect was in this uh, Paris exposition, part of the way he decided to show his stats were with these really amazing um, data visualization drawings. Which he made himself. Which he made and, and this team of, of college students yeah. in like 1899, mm. 1898. Yeah. And so th there were lots of them. But I was very interested in this idea that Du Bois, who I consider an artist and a, a, a great sermonizer, he was like, he's like my hero, that in a way Du Bois was already playing with a thing that is akin to what we call modernism. And I wonder sometimes, since being an abolitionist was maybe the, one of the few things that he could do, how his artistic practice then lived via um, the speech act. Mm -hmm. And so um, I took the boys' drawings and blew them up as a way of kind of revealing this archive, and I think we can... Yeah, so yeah but Fiesta, when you say Du Bois, Du Bois, I, of course I also think of Joseph Bois, <laughs> and uh, sorry to come back no, to please, this. No, please, no, please. And maybe uh, taking it also as an excuse to, to address a little bit more your general notice of, of art or the artist. Uh, so, so part of your project will take place in the Gegenwart, yes. which of course is also taking place under the roof of, of Joseph Boyce Absolutely. as a patron, as everything that's happening there. And, and uh, you once said the word artist has been too small for too long. The word artist has been too small for too long. How, how did you mean that? And, and, and you see, I want to get you to this yeah. Boyce idea as well. With sure. This. Maybe you can... Uh, so I think, I, I think both art and the word architecture, that, that in the history of making art, um, people needed to be chemists in order to make their own pigments. They needed to understand anatomy at a super thorough level. They, needed, they often understood philosophy and were deeply involved in the politics of the day. And those things were informing when we thought they were just making paintings. In fact, they were making huge declarations about the world against a political party, against a class, against their parents, their, their upbringing, that, that there are all these things that are in play that are not always evident in the, in the painting alone. And so we imagine then that we can just become painters. The pigments are made, the philosophies are predetermined, there's no need for a new philosophy. In fact, we can just kind of cite Marx and everything is okay. And, and I think that there is a way in which there's a lot more, the, the word could be bigger. Or there is room within art for all these other things. We simply don't take advantage of it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in this way, I'm also, um, say, in the way that boys might consider, not that everyone is an artist, but maybe within that comment that, that there is something within people that have a, a, a creative impetus um, to make an action that is different from the given action. Mm -hmm. Like th that there's the capacity to, to look at a thing in one way and then another way and then another way and another way and another way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's this idea that is uh, so great. Mm -hmm. That, that if, I, if I only read history one way, it leaves a lot of things out. But if I'm willing to read about the American war in Vietnam and the Vietnamese war from America, that then maybe I understand better what that moment meant mm -hmm. for lots of different kinds of people. Um, du Bois, in this sense, was also trying to say that, that there's a way in which the, the history of the United States is much more complicated than the world knows, and we need to bring that history and the history of all of its people to the world stage to talk about. You know, the, the strange thing about him is he was also fond of Bismarck. Yeah. He went to That's Berlin and yeah. took it as a model how Bismarck made Absolutely. Germany become a nation for, of nations that were always just fighting with each other yes. and using this as a model for how an American nation yes. might yes. be re... 
newly formed. Yeah. Why don't we just briefly, for five minutes, uh, indi give some uh, very brief survey of where we are with the planning of our project? Um, um, because, um, as uh, Theaster has indicated, we and uh, Søren has said, the, we, we, uh, Theaster's work, the show, will be at the uh, Gegenwart House, Gegenwart, but also in this in this building. Uh, we everything is in flux. We are nothing is determined. But we have uh, had a lot of discussions, and Theaster has been doing a lot of research, and a lot of conversations take place with uh, all the different uh, kind of colleagues. But maybe you can just say something very briefly about Gegenwart, um, the, yes, what will happen in some ways, without uh, saying too much, obviously. Okay, but very, very briefly, <laughs> very briefly. Gegenwart, side of production, production of records, production of reproductions of reproductions, uh, a place that, that plays with the idea of a, yeah, also with a, of a pop cultural use of things that we find in the museum's archives where you mm -hmm. can get your Dura as a carpet mm -hmm. and where we, do some, where we do printing and that will be a place also to hang out. There will be during the Art Basel a black artist's retreat on the roof and we bring the sign from the roof of the Johnson house if we to can the Gegenwart. If we can afford it. That, that's the problem. We, that's, now Curator, we talk about director. our plans. <laughs> now it's out, Josef. There's yes. no way back yeah. now. Thank so you. if there's Thank anybody you. in the audience <laughs> wanting us to sponsor... <laughs> I, I no, think that the for idea. me, the, the way you're talking about production, it also means that the Gegenwart becomes a place of generation. That, that, in a way, we want things to kind of emanate out of the building yeah. and that the production turns into something that delivers to everyday people uh, a new understanding of, of some of the things that I'm investigating in Chicago, but also some of the things that are below deck in the museum, in the basements, in the sub-basements. I think we've all heard about uh, Theaster Gate's interest in archives, in history, in um, uh, artifacts, in everyday objects, and um, we are in that regard your practice and what you have in Chicago, uh, so in the south uh, side of Chicago, is very similar to what we have. We also have archives. Mm -hmm. We have things that almost never get seen, that we don't even know we have them. And so this allows us uh, uh, to rediscover and redefine in a way ourselves as a museum. So, um, and we don't say more, I think, but uh, about what's going on here, because we will see. We'll um, see. And, uh, but maybe we can, at this point, uh, ask, take a few questions, um, and um, if you have them, and so maybe three or so. Anyone interested in having a question? Give it a minute, Joseph. Um, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a, a modernist question for you. Um, by scene, because um, I think we really got an idea of how your practice, how broad it is, as you were saying, as it involves uh, social uh, activities, architecture, but also when we see at the pictures you show of your, of your work mm. in, for example, the Bregan's exhibition, mm. there is a very, an extreme um, uh, aesthetic side of it. So I wonder if um, you ever think of beauty as a, as a thing, and what is its place in your, in your very broad practice? Right on. Whew. Good you question. Did. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. So, um, if if I could maybe just spend a little time on this photograph, uh, this is my current exhibition at Regan Projects in Los Angeles. Um, often, when I think about beauty, maybe I'm also thinking about it adjacent to what someone might call logic, and then for me, maybe. Uh, the, the invisible, eternal, like things that are unseen. So things that are seen, a way of making sense in the world, and things that are not seen, and, and, and me rec wrestling with that. 
if, if we take those three ideas, what I want to do sometimes in an exhibition is I want to give order to some of these things that feel super messy when I'm doing them out in the world. So the bricks that you see on the right, these are bricks that are made by me in my studio and by friends in North Carolina. And our hope, our hope is that we would be able to make bricks that, that could build museums, that could build houses, and that in a way the bricks are a, a purely social enterprise in that I would love to make millions of bricks and have a huge brick manufacturing company that only does cultural institutions. And that as a result of making these kind of semi-handmade bricks, I would be able to employ three or 400 people. And that, that in a way, I love the idea of um, Brotter's bricks. Brotter's, yeah. I like the idea of Lewitt's bricks. But I also like the idea that my conceptual brick might lead to the creation of a brick manufacturing company and then lead that portion of my practice out of art altogether. That it would be born, it would be born with an aesthetic and a beauty, it would be given a logic and an administration, and then it would grow so big that maybe in fact I would build the new walls of the Kunstmuseum Basel. So where's the beauty? She's, she, where's the beauty? I think Just that, to bring you back to But I, I think that maybe that is the beauty. Yeah. That, 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 that it requ the beauty for me requires a kind of, uh, uh, um, it's not just about a pretty thing, but a, a unification of the invisible, the visible, and a logic. And, and that, that those things together, like say, this work to me, it won't complete itself until I own a brick manufacturing company. And that at that point that I have both um, the Kunstmuseum who will own this work of art and the brick manufacturing company together, this together feels like a kind of beautiful idea. If you could go back one more, this one, uh, to the, I'm sorry, yeah. This one. So, and then there's a ceramic pot that I made, again, trying to unify my love of the industrial, my love of craft, and then there's another work that is just a sculptural weird object, my love of sculpture, and that those three things in clay, the material doing very, very different things, those three, those three things together feel like another trinity or a unity that, that makes me feel like a kind of beautiful moment has happened. Thank you so much. Any more questions? No, so let's go and have a drink. No, there's, there's someone. Yeah. Back there. The very end. Wow. Whoa. Way back. My English is not so good, but I tried. For me, probably the most inspiring, what you said, was this about your father and doing this, like, action painting, because... I grew up on the countryside and then I went studying here in Basel and this was a time of separation, you know, I looked back to the countryside and I thought, yeah, the, the city is cooler and this, all this intellectual stuff and there I see a, a huge problem in, in, in our times, all this, this stuff also with, with Trump in the US and so because there is, yeah, the work some work is very important, you can get a lot of money with it, and other work is not, you know, it's not like art. And for me that was very inspiring that you said this, this crafting of your father, that's also art for me. I liked it really much. <laughs> so that's a comment, that was not a question. It, that it's a question, yeah. that's a question. Yeah. And yeah, I got it. Yeah, great. I got yeah. it. Yeah. So for the last couple of days I've been talking uh, with my friend Zelma here about this basic income. And this idea that, that there's a way in which we might have a philosophy where um, if people didn't have the anxiety of money, and then they were left with this idea of like, well, what do you want to do with your life or your time? Would the person who's a finance banker today choose to be a carpenter? Or the person who is a, a real estate developer, maybe they really want to do landscape paint, landscape, uh, landscaping. But in fact, one recognizes that uh, 
certain things have a financial value, and we push and we push our kids and our lives toward those things, and it means that there's a kind of separation of other things. And I think that maybe one, if there was one agenda in the work, it, it is to suggest that we don't have to separate our country self from our city self. That, that in a way we have the right to bring the country with us wherever we go, and that in the, if we were to think about the country as the colonial, the formerly colonized, the minority, the thing that you want to forget about, the, that in a way it could also be seen as the post-museum, the post-modern, the, 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 the great possibility. Like I think Rim Coolhouse is starting to think about what happens when all these people move to cities, what happens in the places that they've left? Mm -hmm. Right, and so so people are now kind of re, you know, kind of returning to the country and thinking about what might happen there and how the conditions of the country might make life more interesting than those in the city. But I, but I like this idea that that in a way we're always looking for some kind of unity of our ideologies, so that we don't have to accept only the country is good or only the city is good, but that that maybe all, they both offer something. And for me. I think that studio practices offer something, and then these things outside of the studio, they kind of feed each other and, and, and make for a much more interesting practice. Thank you Great. all. Great. Great summary. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Oh. oh. All set. The last one. Okay. One more. Okay. We said three. You said so. three, Jesse. Yeah, so, me. So, thank you very much for this very interesting introduction to your work. Um, the political situation in America is omnipresent actually in Europe and you presented yourself as an artist who's also very motivated to change his environment for better. Is there anything you plan as a project to, to respond to the actual situation? Is there anything planned in that direction? Yes. <laughs> um, my labor is my protest. I will go to work. Thanks, Jason.